Welcome to the lecture for Module 11. In Module 11, we're going to discuss union contracts and employee discipline. If you remember from Module 10, we covered informal and progressive employee discipline. And now in Ch Module 11, we're going to discuss, in general, union membership, but we're also going to specifically narrow down on how being a member of a union impacts how an employer can discipline you. And it's really important because there is approximately 195,000 people employed by the state of New York. Now, the number varies a bit depending on which source you use, but we're going to use that number for purposes of our course. So most of those 195,000 New York State employees are employed in the executive branch, the branch that we've been working on all semester. And we know from an earlier module that New York State has over 100 agencies and authorities in the executive branch. And it takes a lot of employees to operate that many organizations. A labor union is any organization that represents the collective interests of a group of employees. A labor union is any organization that represents the collective interests of a group of employees. And it's those collective interests that leads to the expression collective bargaining. That's what unions do for union members. They do collective bargaining. They negotiate with the executive authority on contract terms and they're bargaining on behalf of their members. You can use the term union, labor union, employee union, or collective bargaining unit. Those are all correct terms. Now I want you to think about the types of services that New York State employees perform. Everything from transportation, law enforcement, medical services, environmental safety, tourism, human services, tax and finance, corrections, correctional facilities, agriculture, education from K through 12 through our public education system and then also through SUNY, right, in the 64 SUNY colleges and universities, veteran services, consumer protection, energy and utilities, the lottery, emergency management, liquor and cannabis, right? We got a brand new state agency about a year ago. The Office of Cannabis Management never had that before, right? These are just some of the areas that New York State employees are involved in. That is a very diverse group of services, right? What the lottery does for New York State is much different than what the energy and utility protection agencies do, and very different from environmental safety and law enforcement, right? So a wide variety of areas. So try to imagine employees in all these different areas from a hundred different agencies, each trying to advocate for themselves with the governor for health benefits, salaries, number of vacation days, parking, seniority, holidays, sick leave, disciplinary procedures, and all the other numerous items that have a direct impact on every employee's job. I mean, simply said, that would simply just be impossible. And that's why we have labor unions. A labor union exists to represent the collective interests of a large group of employees. Here's 14 primary unions for New York State employees. Number one is CSEA. CSEA is broken into a couple different units. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Then you have PEF, Professional Scientific and Technical. PEF stands for Public Employees Federation. Then there's the UUP, State University Professional Services Negotiating Unit, State University, that's SUNY, Division of Military and Naval Affairs, security supervisors, then there's several for law enforcement, for the corrections officers is different than the ones for the other law enforcement, right? This is a lot. So here's 14 primary unions, different unions that represent a ton of New York State employees. And these unions don't even count for the employees employed by counties, municipalities, and towns and villages within the state. This is just covering New York State employees. So you'd imagine the list of unions we could come up with if we covered all the unions that protect K 
county employees, municipal employees, town and village employees. It's an extraordinary list. And let's for a second consider the size of some of our New York State agencies. For example, the New York State Department of Health has over 30,000 employees. They have statewide offices. They run hospitals and research facilities all across New York State. Likewise, the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, the one we normally just call DOCS, also has over 30,000 employees, and DOCS operates minimum, medium, and maximum security prisons statewide. These are enormous agencies. So when I pick on you about your writing, like for example, when you're writing a policy and I pick on you about your grammar and your spelling, this is why. I want you to imagine writing a policy that goes to over 30,000 people. You wanna make sure it's correct. Some agencies are on what we call the medium size. For example, the New York State Children and Family Services Office is about 2,500 employees. They have regional offices around the state. So that's a medium size agency. And then there are very small state agencies. For example, consider the Developmental Disabilities Planning Council has 45 employees in one office. So we have a huge range in the size of our state agencies. Likewise, New York State employee salaries vary a great deal. Remember in the earlier module we talked about the hiring rate? Remember that the hiring rate is the starting salary in a job title. And the hiring rate, or the starting salary, depends generally on the amount of experience the person is required to have for the job, and the amount of education that's required to apply for the position. So for example, a CSEA, salary grade nine, so a grade nine employee, doesn't require any job experience, it does require a high school diploma, and the hiring rate or starting salary is about $35,000. You compare that to a PEF employee, salary grade 18, requires a lot of job experience and a four-year degree, and the hiring rate is $62,000. So you can see just from those two examples that a more entry-level position with no experience in a high school diploma is gonna pay considerably less than a union position that requires a lot of experience in a four-year degree. That makes sense. It's also important to note that the highest union salaries for long-term state employees are about $100,000 for CSEA, and about $160,000 for PEF employees. So union employees, people often think those are, you know, it's a laborer position. What are you making, you know, minimum wage or $15 an hour, or you only have a starting salary of $35,000. Really important to remember that union salaries in New York State can reach $100,000, $150,000 or more. Of course, those are employees who have served an awful lot of time in their positions. Remember, overtime work can also double a state employee's earnings. This often happens with our New York State Police, corrections officers, and those in the health fields, right? People who have to run a hospital. You can't close it at five o'clock. It's gotta be staffed 24 seven. Likewise, our correctional facilities and our law enforcement officers who work 24 seven. These state employees can maybe earn a starting salary of $60,000 a year, but by the end of the year, they've earned over $100,000 because of all of the overtime hours they've worked. So New York State salaries can vary quite a bit. Let's just think of an example, look at an example from SUNY Albany, right? So a laborer position employed by SUNY Albany earns about $30,000 a year. These positions require a high school diploma. Most of them require a New York State driver's license, but doesn't require any additional education or experience. An administrative assistant at SUNY Albany, their starting salary is usually about $40,000. An accountant employed by the university will have a starting salary of about 60. Full-time professors at SUNY Albany, which requires extensive teaching experience and a PhD, a PhD is required for a full-time professor position at SUNY Albany, their starting salaries are about $80,000. Now here's my surprise for you. What do you guess the president of SUNY Albany earns? I want you to take a guess. 
Do you have a guess? The president of SUNY Albany earns $385,000 a year. Is that more than you guessed? It was much more than I guessed, I can tell you that. So you've got one university, the salaries can range from $30,000 to almost $400,000. That's a huge range in salary differences between employees. In an earlier module, we talked briefly about the New York State Office of Employee Relations. It's often called GOER because its former official name was the Governor's Office of Employee Relations, so you'll hear people call it GOER or OER, right? You can call it anything you want. GOER was created to represent the governor in negotiations with the state public unions. Now remember, you've got 14 primary unions representing over 100,000 employees. That's a lot of negotiations that are going on that affect an awful lot of people. So the governor needs to be represented in those negotiations, and that negotiation is covered for the governor by GOER or the New York State Office of Employee Relations. They work on behalf of the governor in employee negotiations. So it's important to remember, GOER represents the governor's interests in negotiations with the unions that represent public employees. Now it takes a long time. You can imagine a union is representing over 50,000 people. Even people in the same union can have a wide variety of needs, right? Some employees are really concerned about employee safety. If you work literally with your rear end hanging out on a New York State highway every day, you're gonna have a lot of safety concerns and about staying safe while you're performing your job duties. If you're an administrative assistant at SUNY Albany, your primary concern probably isn't your physical safety, but maybe your benefit package, right? So you have an awful lot of terms and an awful lot of employees. It takes a very long time to negotiate a contract between a public employee union and the governor. When they finally agree on all of the terms, they issue a contract. And because it takes so long to hammer out these contracts, the term of the contract is usually good for four to five years. And you can expect that about in year three, they're already negotiating for the next contract. But usually any contract issued between a union and the governor is good for four to five years. The contracts are usually about 200 pages long. You're actually going to look at one this week in one of your assignments. Not going to ask you to read all 200 pages, but just you'll be flipping through it to just kind of get the scope of the document. Covers numerous topics, everything from salaries, disciplinary procedures, benefits, time and attendance rules, vacation, personal time, dress codes. All those terms of employment all have to be hammered out in that contract in a very specific way. As an agency, GOER does more than just represent the governor in contract negotiations. The GOER website contains a wealth of information regarding every issue for which GOER is responsible, and they have a wide variety of duties. For our course, the most important aspect of GOER is that they serve as the advocate for the governor in public employee contract negotiations, but just important to note, they do do more than that. Complete copies of every current contract between the state of New York and the 14 employee unions are available on their website. And really important to remember, the GOER website is a really valuable research for public personnel administrators. If you're in this field in New York State, you're gonna be on the, go the governor's website a lot, looking up salary schedules and union terms and all sorts of stuff. So just remember that's available at oer.ny.gov, oer.ny.gov. So I'm sure you imagine when you were a kid, you probably played, you know, tug of war. You'd have two teams on each side and you'd pull the rope back and forth until somebody won the game. Well, it happens in state government too, especially with union contracts. The governor needs the executive agencies to provide all of the necessary service to members of the public in an efficient and cost-effective way. And the governor, to a certain degree, is also trying to limit the number of state employees to lessen the burden on state taxpayers, right? Because not only do we have to pay state employees now, think about pension plans. We pay for state employees throughout their retirement. So state employees are expensive to have, regardless of their salary. So the governor is trying to get the most efficient, cost-effective workforce he can get. The people who work for the state want low-cost health insurance, fair wages, safe working environments, 
job protection, and pensions. These items and other benefits are expensive to the taxpayers who have to pay for it, right? Because it's all paid for by your tax dollars. So this is the tug of war that goes on between the governor and goer and the state employee unions. So imagine the union employees are on one side and they're pulling the rope to win benefits for their members. And on the other side of the rope is goer and they're pulling on the rope trying to advocate for the governor to obtain the most services at the lowest cost. And this is the tug of war that goes on every time a contract has to be negotiated between the state employee unions and goer. We talked about it can take a long time to get a contract ratified, right? So suppose that there's a PEF contract for the years 2019 to 2023. So it starts in 2019 and it runs throughout 2023. Well, now it's 2023 and a new contract has not been issued. Now what happens? Well, back in 1967, New York State enacted the Public Employees Fair Employment Act, but everyone just calls it the Taylor Act. You'll hear people talking about the Taylor Act. And one of the provisions of the Taylor Act addresses the issue of expired contracts. And essentially what the Taylor Act says is if a public employee contract expires before a new one is approved, the terms of the expired contract continue to apply until the new contract is issued. So the current terms of the contract, even past 2023, those terms are still valid until another contract is issued. And this may not sound like a really big deal, but it is. If you're employed at a state agency, your salary is dictated by the contract. And remember when we looked at salary schedules? Salary schedules are in the contracts. So if you've gotten hired at your hiring rate, your starting salary, and you've worked through your steps and you're now at the job rate, the highest salary that can be earned in your position, you can't earn any more money in your grade until a new contract is approved. You've reached the highest amount of money for that contract term. And it can take a year or more to approve a new contract. So you could be waiting a long time to get a raise. And all of the other terms of the contract also still apply. So if the union is desperate to change or add a term to the contract, well, it's stuck with the old contract terms until a new one is approved. So expired contracts aren't great for state employees, but expired employee contracts are not good for the state itself either. When a new contract is finally approved a year, a year and a half, or maybe even two years after the last one expired, the state may have to retroactively pay affected employees millions of dollars in a lump sum. And of course, they didn't plan for this. They didn't set aside money and put this aside in the state budget like, oh, if the contract expires, it's going to cost us $1.5 million in retroactive pay, so let's put that money aside. You know the state's not doing that. So when the state has to pay a large sum of money it didn't plan for, it has to be taken from something else. It has to be taken from some other source in the budget, which means money for some other proposed project isn't getting paid for this year. So in summary, expired employee contracts are not good for union members, not good for state employees, and it's not good for the state or the governor either, right? We really need these contracts to be issued timely. When one expires, the new one needs to be issued. We have a lot of employees and unions. In fact, in module three, we discussed that our state has the highest percentage of public employees who belong to a union in the entire country. Doesn't that sound like a final exam question? It really sounds like a quiz question and a final exam question. New York state has the highest percentage of public employees who belong to a union in the entire country. So 72.3% of people employed by a New York state county, city, town or village are in an employee union and in New York state employees we're talking about employees employed by the state itself 94 percent belong to a union so if you are a public personnel administrator in New York state you better become an expert on the union contracts because you have to follow all of the union contract terms related to discipline in order to take action against any employee 
Let's look at the two biggest unions. We'll start with CSEA. CSEA stands for the Civil Service Employees Association, but everyone just calls it CSEA. They are the New York State's largest public employee union. CSEA is the state's largest employee public union. They have about 66,000 members. They're so big, they're divided into smaller units to represent groups of employees with different needs. So in the list of those 14 state employee unions we looked at a minute ago, four of them are controlled by CSEA. They're divided into the Administrative Services Unit, the Operational Services Unit, the Institutional Services Unit, and the Division of Military and Naval Affairs Unit. So not only do you need to know what the CSEA contract is, you got to make darn sure you know all the different contracts that fit CSEA employees. So you can't assume your CSEA employee is in the Administrative Services Unit. They could be in the Institutional Services Unit, which may have different contract terms. Yikes, that's an awful lot of stuff you're going to be looking up, right? Let's compare that to PEF. PEF stands for Public Employees Federation. Everybody just calls them PEF. They are the state's second largest public employee union. They have about 50,000 members statewide. And the most common unit is called Professional, Scientific, and Technical. Everyone calls it PS&T for PEF, Professional, Scientific, and Technical. So if you see PEF, PST, that's Public Employee Federation, Professional, Scientific, and Technical. The majority of PEF job titles require a college degree. And you can remember that because it's professional, scientific, and technical, right? It sounds like you're probably going to need a college degree for that. So just to go over this again, total number of New York State employees is about 195,000. Represented by a union, 183,000 of them. CSEA and PEF combined are 116,000 state employees. So it's absolutely essential that when you work in this field, you are very familiar with the CSEA and PEF contracts because that's going to cover most of your employees. And other unions have an additional 67,000 employees. But do you see the problem with the math here? If there's 195,000 total. And 183,000 are represented a union. What about the 12,000 people who aren't in a union? What about them? Well, that's management confidential. And you may have remembered us talking about them very briefly in an earlier module. These are appointed positions. They are referred to as management confidential. And we'll talk about them in more detail later. But for now, we're going to focus on those in the employee unions. Benefits of union membership are a lot, right? Especially if they ask the unions, they're happy to tell you about why it's better to belong to a union than not. But the primary purpose of any employee union is to protect members' jobs. That is their primary purpose. They want to prevent layoffs. They do not want their employees being laid off or furloughed. They want to ensure that there is a multiple level disciplinary procedure because they want to keep employees from being terminated. So the number one primary purpose of any employee union is to protect the members' jobs. And unions work very hard to negotiate for contract terms that make it difficult for employers to discipline their members. So every union contract dictates how employees may be disciplined, and it's usually a long-term, complex process. And why do you have to be an expert on that contract? Because if you fail to follow all of the required steps, the employee cannot be disciplined and they can do some pretty serious stuff and completely escape any discipline if you have not followed every single procedure to the letter. So we talked about informal discipline in our previous module. Now we're going to move on to formal discipline and we're just going to use a PEF employee as an example. So in the PEF contract, it says the purpose of the disciplinary procedure is to provide a prompt, equitable, and efficient procedure of the imposition of discipline for just cause. So they say prompt and equitable. It's not really prompt. All their steps do require some time. 
But what this is essentially saying is in order for any PEF employee to dis be disciplined, there must be just cause. And the definition of just cause is sufficient reason. Therefore, to discipline a PEF employee for any misconduct, you must have a sufficient reason for doing so. Now, for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to keep saying you. And when I say you, I'm talking to you. And you are now a public personnel administrator. And you know I love to talk about the Constitution. Early in this semester, we discussed a state employer can violate a person's constitutionally protected rights. The government can violate your rights, and New York State is definitely the government, right? So New York State agencies can violate an employee's constitutionally protected rights. Because in the Constitution, we have a guarantee of due process. And due process is a really concept, you know, complex concept. But what it basically says is federal and state governments have to observe every person's legal rights. And if the state fails to observe a legal right, the result is what we call a due process violation. Think of it this way. When the governor and a union have agreed to a contract, you, the personnel administrator, are responsible for ensuring that every required step is followed. And failure to follow the terms of a union contract could result in a violation of an employee's constitutionally protected rights. So not only have you violated the state contract, you could also violate somebody's constitutionally protected rights. So I think I've driven this point home, right? Really important to know the employee union contract terms and critically important that you follow them perfectly. So let's get to some specifics. Let's talk about interrogation. When I say interrogation, please don't picture like, you know, an old, you know, police film from like, you know, 30 years ago where the police officer's got a shiny light and bright light in someone's face and where were you on Tuesday at two o'clock, right? That's not what we mean when we talk about interrogation when we're talking about public personnel. Interrogation has a very specific meaning in union contracts. And in any union contract in New York State, an interrogation is formal questioning of an employee which could lead to discipline. Interrogation is formal questioning of an employee, which could lead to discipline. Now, does that mean that every time you want to talk to an employee about something, you have to do a formal interrogation? Of course not. Supervisors and personnel administrators and tons of people have to talk to employees every day, all day long about situations that come up in the office and work matters and whether or not something was submitted timely or why something did or didn't get done. So people always have to talk to state employees. The difference is if you are seeking to discipline an employee and you want to have a formal conversation with them, you must serve them with a notice of interrogation. I'm sorry, that's a typo right there. It should say notice of interrogation. Before, before, note, before you formally question an employee, you must serve them with a notice of interrogation. Emphasis on the word before. It doesn't do you any good to do a formal interrogation of an employee and at the end of it go, oh, crap, I forgot to give you your notice, right? No, you just created a real serious problem. Before you formally interrogate an employee, remember interrogation just means having a formal conversation that could lead to discipline. You must serve them with a notice of interrogation. And each union contract is going to specifically define what the notice of interrogation looks like and all of its terms. So the union contract is going to dictate exactly what information must be included in the notice, and it is a written notice. It's always going to require the time, date, and location of the interrogation. It must say that the person has a right to obtain representation, either a union rep or an attorney, and it must also explain to the employee that they have the right to represent themselves. While they have a right to have a union rep or an attorney, they don't have to. They have the right to represent themselves. And then there could be a lot of other terms that have to be in this written notice. If you've properly served the notice of discipline on the employee, the employee is required to attend. This is one part of the contract that helps public personnel administrators, is that the employee just can't get served with this notice and go, yeah, I don't want to. I'm not coming. I'm not doing it. An employee is not allowed to refuse to attend the interrogation. 
If an employee does refuse, we'll go back to the contract because there's going to be some terms in there that says if an employee refuses after the proper notice to attend the interrogation, you're going to have some steps that allow you to move a lot faster toward discipline. So your obligation is to provide a correct notice of interrogation that has all of the required information. And if you do it and you serve it properly, the employee is required to attend. If they refuse to, you're going to probably be able to skip some of the steps in the contract and move a lot faster toward discipline. Written statements. Can you ask an employee who you think did something wrong and who you're thinking about disciplining, can you tell them, I want you to make a written statement and in that statement, I want you to sign it that you swear that you told the truth. Are you allowed to ask a state employee to do a sworn written statement? What do you think? Well, the contracts are going to dictate under what circumstances you can tell an employee you want a sworn written statement. And a sworn written statement just means there's a statement at the bottom of it that says, Everything I have written in this statement is true and correct to the best of my knowledge. It may even say, and I submit this statement under the penalty of perjury, or I swore I've told the truth. It just requires the employee to assert in writing that they have told the truth. Well, if you want a written statement that's sworn from an employee, you can better believe it's going to require ample notice, written explanation of the right to obtain representation, which could include a union rep or an attorney, to help you write the statement or develop the statement or look at the statement before you submit it. It's going to have to inform the employee they have the right to represent themselves. It's going to have to require they have time to consult a union rep or attorney and on and on, right? You're going to have to look at the contract and see everything you have to do before you can demand a sworn written statement from your employee. When the employee does submit a sworn written statement, you must, emphasis must, provide them with a copy of it. So they've written it up, they've signed it, they give it to you. You are required to copy it and give them a copy of that statement. Warning, warning, warning. If you forget any of these steps, the statement cannot be used against the employee in any disciplinary proceeding, no matter what they admitted to in the statement. You can't use it, right? That's going to be painful. That's going to be really painful for you if you've, you know, something so serious is going on, you're instituting formal disciplinary procedures, you get the employee to admit to all this stuff in a sworn written statement, and then you're not allowed to use it because, for example, your notice didn't tell them that they could have time to consult with their union rep. Or your notice was perfect, they submitted the written statement, and you forgot to give them a copy of it. Seems like a minor mistake. It's not. You forgetting to give them a copy of it means you can't use it against them. So again, let's just, for example, we'll just use a PEF employee for an example. If your goal is to discipline a PEF employee, you must serve him or her with a notice of discipline. And I bet you already know I'm about to start talking about how specific the notice has to be. You're kind of sensing a theme, I bet, at this point. The notice of discipline is a written document that must contain every item that's required by the contract. A copy of the notice of discipline must be personally delivered to the employee, which means it must be handed to him or her to their hand. And a copy must also be mailed to the employee's home via U.S. certified mail. So you must personally hand them a copy of the notice of discipline and then you have to mail it to them via U.S. certified mail. If anything's missing from that notice of discipline and or a copy's not provided to the employee or you don't mail it also via certified mail, the employee can't be disciplined. It's imperative that every single required provision is accounted for in writing. It must be done or you're not going to be able to discipline the employee. And I'm sure you've heard people talk about State employees can't get fired no matter what they do. They can do the craziest stuff. They can do it on video and they're never going to get fired. You can't get rid of a state employee. Well, you can, but it's not easy. And the contracts are intentionally written for it not to be easy because remember that union has fought for step by step, very specific disciplinary procedures, and they are going to hold your feet to the fire and make sure you follow them. And if you miss any step, 
guess what? That employee is not getting disciplined. So again, for just for an example, let's talk about a PEF notice of discipline. According to the PEF contract, a PEF employee's notice of discipline must contain the specific acts of misconduct. I can tell you, I'm pretty sure every union contract is going to require these terms, but we're talking about PEF just for the minute. So specific acts of misconduct must be written in the notice of discipline. And that's because you have to inform them what they've been accused of, right? You can't just say, we're going to try to suspend you for three months because we think you did something wrong. No, that's not going to meet the standard. It's going to have to be exactly what you're accusing them of. It's also going to have to be specific to date, time, and place of misconduct. So you can't just say, you're always late. That's not going to have to work. It's going to have to be the dates and times you were late and to what? To the office, to the regional office, literally like street address. Where were they late to? Very, very specific. The penalty sought. You cannot start to formally discipline an employee without already deciding what discipline you're seeking. So you can't go at it like, well, we're not sure what we're going to be able to prove and not prove. We're not sure what the result is going to be. So let's decide later on what discipline we're asking for. You can't do that. It has to be in the notice of discipline what you're seeking. So what are your options? What kind of penalties can you seek? Hate to keep saying the same thing, but the penalties you can seek are in the contract. So for example, in the PEF contract, you can seek a written reprimand. That'd be the lowest level thing you could seek, a written reprimand that's going to remain in their personnel file for a set period of time. A fine. Yes, you can actually make them pay you money, right? You can seek a fine in the PEF contract. That is up to two weeks pay. So if you have an employee who's making $100,000 or more, that could be a substantial amount of money. As discipline, you can ask for loss of accrued vacation time. That's a big thing in the state. We like to accrue our vacation time, right? You can have employees who have hundreds of hours of accrued vacation time. You can seek as discipline for them to forfeit three days vacation, two weeks vacation, right? Whatever terms allowed by the contract. Loss of privileges. So there's not a lot of privileges you can earn as a state employee, but for example, having a state car assigned to you is a privilege, right? If you don't have to use your own personal car and you have a state car assigned to you, they can remove that as discipline. Maybe you have really super extra nice equipment that's allotted to you. You could lose access to that equipment, right? Not, not too many privileges that they get, but um, say a conference. Say you're allowed to attend an in or out of state conference and all the expenses are paid for. You could lose that as discipline. Suspension without pay. So you could be suspended from work. You're not coming to work for a specific period of time. And during that time, you are not getting paid. Restitution. So for example, let's say you've your employees damaged state property. Say they got so mad at their laptop computer, they took it and they smashed it all up, right? Restitution could be, the discipline could be paying the state back for the cost of that computer. Demotion, meaning you are a grade 16 employee and you're going to be demoted to a grade 14 employee. Or perhaps you've moved up and you're now a supervisor. You could lose your ability to supervise other employees. So being demoted. And lastly, the most serious penalty you can seek in any contract is going to be termination, that the employee is going to be fired and they're going to lose their job entirely. So everything from a written reprimand being the lowest level to termination being the most serious are all possible under the PEF contract. And those terms are pretty similar in most of the state contracts. What else has to be in the notice of discipline? The right to be represented by a union rep or attorney. It absolutely must be in the notice of discipline to inform them they have the right to representation. Also, the notice has to give them a reasonable amount of time to obtain an attorney. And the contract's going to tell you how much that time is, whether it's 10 business days or it's 14 calendar days, whatever it is, it's going to be in the contract. Make sure it's in your notice of discipline that you have 10 days to confer um, with an attorney or your union rep, right? It's got to be in there. 
right to file a disciplinary grievance within 14 days. Why do they get to file? Well, when a PEF employee and when most state union employees are served with a notice of discipline, they are allowed to file a disciplinary grievance saying that the seeking to um, discipline the employee is inappropriate, to say that you have not followed all the steps you were supposed to follow to get this far and therefore you can't be disciplined, or that there's more to it than you know and there's you know other employees conduct that may be relevant or their supervisor told them they could do something and now you're saying they did something wrong right so they want to file a grievance so in the PEF contract it says in the notice of discipline you must have a statement that they have a right to file a disciplinary grievance within 14 days it also has to say they have the right to have the discipline reviewed by an independent arbitrator. So that is the process. So you're going to move through all the disciplinary procedures in the union contract and all the disciplinary procedures that are followed by your agency. And when all is said and done and discipline has been approved, whether it's they're getting a written reprimand, they're losing vacation time, they're getting demoted or fired, they have a right to have that decision reviewed by an independent arbitrator. And the arbitrator's decision will be final and binding. All of that stuff has to be in your notice of discipline. Well, what about an employee who's done something really, really serious? For example, what do you do if an employee has committed a serious act that requires their immediate removal from the office? So you don't have a week to get all your paperwork together and all your information and make sure all the terms in the notice are right. This person's done something really serious or egregious. So let's say they took their laptop computer and they threw it across the room and it almost hit another employee in the head. That's a serious act, right? They are now putting another person's safety in jeopardy. What if a person has made a threat, right? Let's say they've made the most serious threat and they said, I'm going to bring a gun into this office and I'm going to shoot everybody here, right? That's absolutely the most serious, egregious conduct. Maybe they punched another employee in the face, right? I don't mean to laugh, but like, this is serious stuff. You can't be going, oh, well, I know he just punched his supervisor in the face, but I got to make sure all my paperwork is correct. So he's going to be here in the office for the next couple of days. It can't happen. So what do you do if an employee has committed a serious act that requires their immediate removal from the office? And the answer is, if you've made a determination that an employee's continued presence at the office will present a potential danger to people or to property, or their continued presence will severely interfere with agency operations, you may suspend the employee immediately without pay. So you may say to that person, you need to leave the office right now and you're not returning until you're told you can return it. So get up, get your personal belongings and leave the office now, right now. Don't touch your computer, don't touch anything. Grab your personal stuff, grab your bag, and go now. You can do this if you've made a determination their continued presence in the office presents a potential danger to people or property, or if it severely interferes with agency operations. You can suspend the employee immediately without pay. But the contract's gonna say if you do that, you have to follow up with the notice of discipline and immediately start the formal procedures. So for example, if an PEF employee does something like punch another employee in the face, you can immediately dismiss them from the office. You can tell them they cannot return until notified. You can turn off their swipe card. You can take their keys. You can prevent them from returning to the office. But in the PEF contract, within five days, you have to serve them with the notice of discipline and then start your formal procedures. What if an employee has done something that's actually committing a crime, like punching someone in the face, or selling cocaine in the office, or stealing 20 laptop computers? If they've actually committed a crime, what are your options here? Well, if the police have charged a state employee with a crime for something committed on the job, you can suspend the employee without pay immediately. But guess what? You're going to have to serve them with a notice of discipline and still do all the normal disciplinary procedures. 
So for example, if the police have charged an APEF employee, say, with stealing 20 computers from the Department of Transportation, you can immediately put them out of work. You can take their swipe card, your keys, they can't come back to the office. But you have to serve them with the notice of discipline within 30 days of the suspension. So even for this most serious conduct, assaulting another person, selling drugs at the office, stealing, making threats about, you know, gun violence, really serious stuff, you can get them out of the office immediately, but you're still going to have to do all the normal disciplinary procedures you'd have to do for somebody who's been late to work 300 times. So this week, one of your assignments is going to be to look at the PEF contract. And as I said before, I don't expect you to read all 200 pages of it. I would never ask you to do that. You are going to be required to look at the table of contents. This is going to help you see just how many different terms and topics are covered in the contract. And then I'm going to ask you to locate the section on employee discipline and just review it. You don't need to memorize all the terms as it relates to discipline, but I just want you to see how discipline is described in the contract and how they describe the text as a, you know, opposed to just how I describe it in my own words during our lecture, right? So I want you to see the actual contract terms. So you don't have to memorize all the disciplinary terms in the PEF contract. However, when you've completed module 11, my expectation is that you're going to be able to explain the importance of understanding union contract provisions. Why is it so important for public personnel administrators to understand union contract terms. And we talked about several of those reasons in this lecture. My expectation is you're also going to be able to explain the consequence of an agency or a human resources official violating terms of a union contract. What are the possible consequences of that for both you as a personnel administrator and for your efforts at discipline an employee? What, what's going to happen with that? I want you to be able to list several possible disciplinary actions. There's quite a few in the PEF contract, for example, written reprimands and demotion, termination, loss of accrued vacation time. Those are all examples of possible disciplinary actions. And I also want you to be able to describe several steps commonly found in a disciplinary procedure. That could be a notice of discipline, a notice of interrogation, or a demand for a written statement. Those are all steps that are commonly found in disciplinary procedures. So that's the end of our lecture. I want you to go ahead and move on with the other items in this week's module. As always, if you have any questions about the course material or what's expected this week, please just send me an email.